Admiral Kolambage, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, my first question is one of the hottest topics in the country right now, the upcoming UNHRC sessions which will be held in Geneva next month, the 46th session I think. Mm -hmm. um, now you were appointed to the role last year, uh, I think it was August 2020, this is almost a year after President Gotabir Rajapaksa um, became mm -hmm. president. Um, I What I would like to know is were you, okay besides all of this for a long time you have anyway been President uh, Gotabe Rajapaksa sort of foreign advisor. In addition to that you are seen as something of an expert in areas of China and Chinese relations. Were you appointed to this role in the run up, in months run up to the UNHRC sessions because you have sort of unique skills to be able to navigate these choppy waters so to speak? Well, I think the President uh, Gotabe Rajapaksa has been looking at what I was doing, uh, especially during the, my time in the Navy. And I think especially so after my retirement uh, in 2014, uh, because I think I'm a bit of a unique character because I went back to school at the retirement age. I started reading for my PhD on international relations yes. and I did it in 2015. I was awarded the first PhD yeah. and then of course postdoctoral I started uh, talking and teaching and uh, you know presenting various papers. So I would call my expertise is uh, in uh, yes international relations but more to do with maritime security and strategic maritime consideration in the Indian Ocean. Uh, so I was not limited to China. Mm -hmm. I, have, I have been lecturing in mm -hmm. India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, China and Japan. Mm -hmm. So these are the five countries that I have been working. And I was also writing a lot uh, mm -hmm. on various topics uh, in the, uh, the Indian Ocean, maritime security, the strategic consideration. And I was talking in many forums. I was getting invited for mm -hmm. many forums. And I was also teaching here mm -hmm. international relations like conflict resolution in the Columbia University, uh, Bandaranaike Center for International Studies, Bandaranaike International Diplomatic Training Institute, Kotlavala Defense University, Staff College. Mm -hmm. So it was, I think, quite a different uh, role that I performed, especially after leaving the military service in 2014. Mm -hmm. So the President Rajapaksa, I'm sure he was monitoring mm -hmm. what I was doing. And then he thought, okay, uh, he's uh, the best person uh, at this juncture mm. uh, to carry forward the vision of the president and the government. Mm. Because, uh, I mean, foreign relation is a tool to carry forward the vision of the government to the international arena. Mm. And uh, I think he must have felt that we haven't done that uh, uh, sufficiently. Mm. Uh, because, uh, I mean, I have to tell you that... Uh, this is the first time in Sri Lanka we have a president who was actually trained to do the job. You know, mm -hmm. he, four years and four and a half years, he was studying various aspects. He was traveling to various countries and he had these uh, academics uh, joining mm -hmm. him, the professional. Mm -hmm. So they were discussing all these aspects. And then they came out with the vistas of prosperity mm -hmm. and splendor. Now in that, actually, there are three pillars of uh, the president's uh, the vision. Number one is national security. Yes. Number two is economic development. Mm -hmm. Number three is foreign relations. So basically through foreign relations, yes. how do we maintain national security and economic development of all people in the country. So then he would have thought, okay, uh, so and so is the best person to do this job. And I carry a lot of experience as a practitioner on maritime security, mm -hmm. uh, maritime diplomacy, because I have done 36 year and a half years in the Navy mm -hmm. and I have traveled to about 47 countries as part of my naval training, naval exposure. And uh, combining with my PhD and my teaching experience, my writing, uh, you know, presenting papers, I think I kind of establish a mark yes. uh, in international relations, uh, maritime strategy. And then, uh, you know, even when I was in the Navy, I was considered as somewhat a teacher because right. I like to teach uh, yes. what I know. I, I believe in, you know, transferring knowledge, you know, empowering the young people. Mm -hmm. So when I was commander, I did many programs to empower the people. You know, I introduced uh, something similar to Toastmasters Club mm -hmm. where people, you know, talk about a topic in various forums all over the country. And I used to write everything and whenever I visited, I talked mm -hmm. uh, about uh, how the country should be then. So therefore, I think the president thought, okay, he needs some fresh inputs to the foreign service. And he appointed me uh, as his additional secretary 
uh, for foreign relations in uh, 2019 December mm. and in 2020 August he appointed me to be the foreign secretary so I've been doing it uh, it's a very challenging job uh, but my expertise my practitioner expertise my exposure uh, has really kind of groomed me to do this job yes. so here yes. I am he need foolproof strategies to fight to make it happen Actually, aside from the interview, I was just thinking when I met you also, you had a very profess like a professorial uh, uh, as like a attitude to you, and I almost wanted to call you professor. So what well, you're saying I am makes a sense. Professor. Actually, <laughs> I go as I, I'm the only admiral professor in this whole country. Wow! Right. Yeah. So no, no one has uh, come to. I mean, of course, we have quite a few admirals. They, are, they have done great service. Yeah. And yeah. we have many, many professors. Mm. But admiral professor is the only Plus. me. Okay. We give the 40 points for the Secretary of the Foreign Affairs to show who made Sri Lanka poor. Read all to gather important facts to show at you in it. Okay. You're speaking about Japan, um, India and other regional countries. Now there has been some concern that with this uh, East Container Terminal Agreement falling through, mm -hmm. that India and Japan may not support us at the UNHRC sessions. Now, Japan is not a part of the 47. Well, they are. They are. They are. Okay. And mm -hmm. in, but India is. is very and much, China yeah. last year mm -hmm. became a member. Mm -hmm. We have Russia in there. And there's also Cuba. Yep. Cuba, we sponsored a co, uh, we co sponsored a resolution with, mm -hmm. I think, in 2012. Yep. Um, so, are you confident that uh, Sri Lanka has enough friends in the UNHRC uh, to. Well, um, to answer the question, you see, the, the Human Rights Council has 47 members. And if you look at their composition, uh, majority of them are the West oriented mm. or coming from the global north, mm. the political north, or they are allies, or they are, you know, carrying their orders, mm. right? So this is the reality in the, uh, the Human Rights Council. So it is practically impossible for a small country like Sri Lanka to win 24 votes, mm. right? So, I mean, this is the reality. We have mm. to face it. And also, one thing that I have observed, because we have been analyzing what has happened uh, since 2009 mm -hmm. uh, until 2021, the arguments, the ideology, the work done is not going to get you votes. Mm -hmm. It's the lobbying, it's the, you know, big powers lobbying is the determinant factor. So, we are unfortunately uh, facing something like that. Mm -hmm. But I think this year, 2021, we are in a much stronger position than before uh, because we have, uh, I mean, so-called many friends in mm. the Human Rights Council. You mentioned uh, China, Russia, uh, and we hope, uh, if you look at Japan, you asked specifically about mm. Japan and India. Well, India at one point voted against us, and after that, they did not, they yeah. abstained from voting. And Japan basically abstained from voting. So we need to understand the geopolitical mm -hmm. reality of this. Mm -hmm. Japan and Korea mm -hmm. are considered as Western allies okay. in the East, right? Because they have large number of Western troops in their country. They are maintaining security. So they cannot just uh, come to uh, the Human Rights Council and say, oh, Sri Lanka has done well. So therefore, we have to support you. It's difficult for them to make that decision because they are allies of some big powers. Mm -hmm. But then there are other countries, you know, from the global south mm -hmm. would say, no, these country specific resolutions are wrong, mm -hmm. right? The United Nations should be really supporting the countries to overcome the difficulties, not really be the arbitrator, not really be the global policeman. So there are countries. So there are, we call them the like-minded group, mm -hmm. LMG. So this year, we are really campaigning to get more uh, LMGs, like-minded countries to support us. You ask about India. Mm -hmm. Well, India hasn't told us anything yet, but we are hopeful that India, because India has a stated policy of neighborhood first. Yes. They have a stated policy of Sagar, that is security and growth for all in the region. And we have excellent relations between the two countries. Of course, when it came to the East Container Terminal, there was a, I think there is a, you know, little bit of a heartache. So we had to correct that. Mm -hmm. You see, you mentioned about the East Container Terminal. This is something I feel personally, I'm, I'm representing my opinion. You know, a country should undertake investment for, the, the, for economic reasons, majority, yeah. right? For the betterment of the country. But unfortunately, Sri Lanka does not have that luxury 
to make decisions based purely on economics. Mm. Why? Because we are so close to India, our biggest mm. neighbor, and the central location of Sri Lanka in the Indian Ocean across the busiest world shipping route in the world. Right? 50% of world containers, 35% of bulk cargo, nearly 72% of world energy pass every day just few nautical miles south of Sri Lanka. And Sri Lanka is actually the whole Indian Ocean, the pivot is Sri Lanka, mm -hmm. the small country. Mm -hmm. So this geographical, geopolitical, geostrategical location of Sri Lanka, sometimes it's a blessing, sometimes it is a curse. Mm -hmm. Right now, that is why I say because the East Container Terminal. You see, look at the East Container Terminal. We have not been able to use the terminal for last five years. Mm. I think little more than five years. Six hundred meters of berth completed. Mm. Cranes have arrived, but we can't use our own port. Right. So the previous government in 2019 signed an MOU that it will be given to India and Japan. Now the president came. He did not want to renegade on that. He said, no, the previous government, it's a government of Sri Lanka, yeah. has made a commitment. I will honor that. So he was determined to honor this MOU. Uh, and then he was working uh, to that. But then the public opinion turned against it. The trade unions, the professionals, the Buddhist clergy especially. Mm -hmm. And they rallied around this thought that no, it should not be uh, given to India. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then president couldn't do it. Mm. Now people argue, you know, uh, I think, you know, the people say that after president became, I mean, after Gotabe Rajapaksa became president, he has gathered a lot of executive powers. No, it is not the case. There are many checks and balances because we have to go through the cabinet. There is a parliament and the president is determined to go through the proper process. Mm. So he couldn't do it. And now we have offered the best container terminal. So India is not very comfortable because we have, you know, backtrack uh, on a promise that we have given. Uh, so we need to uh, sort it out. And we are hoping because there are four countries in this region, India, Pakistan, Nepal and Bangladesh in the Human Rights Council. If we have solidarity in our region, I think that will send a very strong message. But if we cannot get that solidarity, our message will be weak, mm -hmm. right? So we are doing it, we are campaigning, we are working very hard. The president is personally talking to uh, almost all the ambassadors and high commissioners and our missions in various capitals are doing their part and we are writing all the letters, summaries. Uh, so we have a very good campaign going on. Uh, so we are not ready to surrender without a fight. Mm -hmm. At Flexport Innovations and a former Commissioner of Inventions Dr. Nanda Dasanaryana was focusing on finding digital solutions on reconciliations for the last 10 years as language barriers make all of us separated. When they go to police, doctors, discussions, meeting with Sinhala officers in Sri Lanka they cannot communicate properly. Yesterday Dr. Narayana met Dr. Sunil Nawar and Director General of Institute of Education. They have a barrier along North and East as they cannot communicate clearly. National Institute of Business Management, NIBM, the oldest government. Business school of the island he saw the systems are ready to teach remote learning but the language barrier makes students separated. So the Flexport innovations foresee this 10 years ago. Flexport made a digital translation device which could instantly translate over 176 languages to joint venture with Germany and USA, thanks to Dr. Narayana's friend Sir Arthur Clarke who made it possible with the internet through his satellite communication to make the whole global village without language barriers. We called it one would one language and German partner offered in one million US dollars and to set up an open university in Sri Lanka one world one language university of Sri Lanka. We're heading into difficult times or choppy waters but we're not willing no, to surrender. No, I'm a sailor. <laughs> yes. Calm waters will never make a good sailor. Correct. Wise words. Yes. Uh, the United Nations Human Rights Commissioner uh, is due to table her report which has uh, also already been out in the media. She's due to uh, table her report uh, this upcoming week. 
In it, she has said, and I quote, the failure of Sri Lanka to address past violations has significantly heightened the risk of human rights violations being repeated. Now, I know Sri Lanka plans to reject these claims at the UNHRC sessions, but while you're still on the ground here, can you tell me uh, what you have to say to this? Like, has Sri Lanka failed to address? Well, yeah, we, we feel, uh, uh, Royal, that the High Commissioner's report is very damning and unfounded, not based on facts, and many of these are perceptions about Sri Lanka. Uh, it could be even some, it appears like a shadow reporting, you know, done by uh, someone in Sri Lanka, uh, because they talk about various aspects which are purely internal domestic matters of a self-respecting sovereign country. I don't think a supranational body has that mandate. The UN mandate is very clear. Every country is equal. Every country is a sovereign, independent country. We are all members like that. So for UN to talk about Sri Lanka's internal domestic matter, I'll, let me share a few examples. Or maybe you have listed few. They're talking about the 20th Amendment. Mm -hmm. Now we all know the 19th Amendment was done in hurry in 2015. And what was the result? Utter chaos to the country. And what was the final result? 253 people dying mm -hmm. on the Easter bombing. Why? Because the 19th Amendment created a division, power struggle between the president and the prime minister. And the worst affected area was national security because they were not working together. Now that the Easter bombing report is mm -hmm. due to be uh, coming out, we will see what it contains. So we lost that. Mm -hmm. And that was the most deadly terrorist attack in Sri Lanka. Very innocent people who went to church mm -hmm. to celebrate the rise of Jesus Christ were killed in an instant. Mm -hmm. Now that was a result of 19th Amendment. So president discussed about it and he wanted to amend it. And then after he become, became the president, when he wanted to uh, amend the 20th Amendment, there were 32 cases mm -hmm. went to the Supreme Court and they rule the parliament has the right to go ahead with the 20th Amendment subjected to certain amendments. That is exactly what the president and the government did. And two thirds of majority, 156 votes to be precise, was in favor of the 20th Amendment. So that means this is purely internal domestic matter of a country. Mm -hmm. Now what right another institution has to say, oh, you have done this, why did you do it? Now it's not like that. Mm -hmm. And then I, earlier I mentioned, you know, the protection or the safeguards which the independent institutions like judiciary and various commission, they are still there. Mm -hmm. The 20th Amendment has not taken anything. Now, the 20th uh, Amendment has not given uh, supranatural powers to the president to, uh, you know, act on uh, his individual. No, he's subjected to various protocols, various procedures in the country. And I think that's a good thing. But then look at our constitution amended 20 times. So we need a good, realistic, uh, I mean, understanding the ground reality constitution. And I think that process is taking place. So see, I just gave you one example. So therefore, we do not accept mm. the uh, report uh, produced by the High Commissioner. Then, then let me also uh, tell you another thing, Royal. You see, now this resolution that we are battling now, of course, originated somewhere in 2009, but culminated in 2015, when for the first time in the history of United Nations Human Rights Council, Sri Lanka went and co-sponsored a resolution against Sri Lanka. That first time, right? Now, that actually took our friends by surprise. Oh, my God. The country is saying, look, we have done something wrong. And it's like, you know, the, the ch child goes to the principal and say, uh, sir, I have done something wrong. Uh, please don't punish me harshly. Something like that. Mm -hmm. But that really led to a situation. So look at the architects of the UN HRC resolution 30 slash 1. Completely rejected by people. They are not even in the parliament system now. So that means... There was a rejection of this act by the people of the country. And also, it was signed in 2015, 2018, the then Yahapal and the unity government lost popularity. Mm -hmm. They lost uh, the local government election. 2019, they lost the presidency. 2020, they lost the government 
and with a two-third majority, a new government was established. I think one of the main reasons, among a few reasons, is of course our economy uh, went on a slum, the bond scam, all that mm. was there. I think one of the major reasons why the majority of people in this country voted for Gotabe Rajapaksa and the, the, the gov government was because they felt that the previous government betrayed the country, surrendered the sovereignty. Because this, uh, if you look at the 30 slash 1, there are three things. One, you cannot do in accordance with the constitution of Sri Lanka. Mm. Two, many things we have done. Three, many things the people of this country do not want us to do. So we need to understand how democracy works. Now, democracy is people's power. Now, people of this country has given a very clear mandate that we do not subject ourselves to a supra-national body like the UN Human Rights Council. This offer was submitted four months ago to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs through our friend Mr. Yapa Legal Secretary of Honorable Minister of Foreign Affairs Dinesh Gunardina. They are evaluating it. Slit, Chairman Professor Lalith Gamage at Dr. Narayana's keynote address on software development proposed to take the lead. Now thanks to Google and our patent on Universal Language Translator, the web Lanka has completed the website access to get connected to the translator, voice to text, text to voice, translation instantly through an applet. www.ultinc.lk And that is why in February this uh, 2020, the Foreign Minister, Honorable Dinesh Kunadana, went to Geneva and said, we are withdrawing from the co-sponsorship. Now the West is angry. They are angry for many reasons. They are angry because they wanted to stop the war uh, during the final stages. But then our political leadership had the resolve to end terrorism. Right? Imagine the situation, Royal, if the war was stopped prematurely in 2009. To date, there would be bombs going on in the country. To date, there will be violence in the country. Now, until 2009, May 19, per month, this country was losing something like 250 lives. Mm. Tamils, Sinhalese, LTTE, soldiers, Muslims, 250 valuable lives. From 2009, May 19, to date, zero. Mm. Now, what is important is that we have right to life here. Right? First, you have to live to enjoy human rights. So, this is why I say the Human Rights Commissioner, and I think, uh, let me uh, stress another point. Now, actually, this report doesn't talk much about the war. Mm. It is only passing reference to the, uh, the accountability, missing person, uh, reparation. Now, they are talking about this year. Mm. Last year, they say, oh, in Sri Lanka, there is a dangerous trend, right, with, as far as human rights is concerned. And... Let me ask you, they have bracketed Sri Lanka among nine countries. And what are these nine countries? Nicaragua, Syria, Iran, Myanmar, Yemen, Venezuela, Belarus, North Korea and Eritrea. Any student of world relations or international relations would say the nine countries that I mentioned, there are civil wars, there are military rule, there are dictatorship. Is it same in Sri Lanka? Not at all. We have a, I mean, the last two elections were certified as free and fair election. When some very developed countries have issues with transition of power, Sri Lanka had smooth transition of power even in 2010, 2015, 2019 and 2020. So I think we are much, much more democratic than the nine countries that I mentioned. And our human right is really enshrined and protected here so we are not supposed to be in that bracket mm. so this is why I say the report we don't accept uh, we will battle on we will indicate our concern logically with facts factual errors errors in law errors in perception these are the three areas that we are writing our reports mm. we have been doing it and we will continue to do that e wish president mr. Sam G Wawai Krameyrothna and U.S. a device marketer proposed to fund on manufacture all equipment locally, using local labor and skills at their Siriya Wiwa, Hambantoto factory run by villagers trained.
This factory was proposed, initiated by the His Excellency the President Gota Abe Irajapaksha. This will enable locals to use Zoom meetings and distant learning in any language at lower cost and enable reconciliation possible. Uh, I also want to move to um, so th this government's continued stance on the UNHRC, um, what the UNHRC wants has been that it should not meddle in domestic uh, accountability measures. Uh, but even previous governments have failed at establishing proper domestic any kind of accountability or reconciliation measures. How does this government plan to do anything different? We presented this language solution at United Nation office with the Her Excellency Miss. Singer demonstrated the instantaneous translation and they were excited for its capabilities to make all United Nations communicate easily. We got software engineers and empower the young working remotely as virtual assistants to translate even government documents as it takes two days to translate as per government red tape. We witnessed it recently in preparation of a cabinet paper they could not complete the final report for translation delay it could have been done by our applet within five minutes. The time to get together like-minded people spread around Sri Lanka and abroad without language barrier is now possible. Well, to answer your question, you know a government should be little more careful when making pledges to the international community. As I mentioned, the co-sponsor in the resolution 30 slash 1, there were three areas. One, unconstitutional. So we can't do it. We can't have foreign judges in Sri Lanka, you know, judging us. The second, the things we have done, I think that is one you are, one, what you are asking. The th third, the people don't want us to do. Now, the then government started the office of missing person, right, and started the office of reparation. And then, of course, there were other human rights council, uh, in council in Sri Lanka, uh, then Office of National Unity and Reconciliation mm -hmm. in Sri Lanka. They started something. And then they wanted to repeal the Prevention of Terrorism Act. They wanted to introduce a Counter-Terrorism Act. Mm -hmm. And they worked with Western countries to uh, design a Counter-Terrorism Act. After four years' deliberation, they, were, they themselves said, this cannot be implemented. Mm -hmm. Imagine the situation if we had repealed the Prevention of Terrorism Act and Easter momming happened, we would have been helpless. Mm -hmm. We would not have been able to tackle that issue effectively. So the point is a government should make pledges only what the people will allow that government to do. Right now, the, the, getting back to the question, we want to continue with the Office of Missing Person. We want to continue with the Office of Reparation. We want to continue with all human rights institutions in the country. Not only continue, we want to empower them. We want to give them funding. We want to make appointments to various positions. Now we have asked their action plan for 2021. Okay, what is your action plan? So we really want these institutions to function. Mm -hmm. Because that is a pledge we have made as a country. So we don't want to backtrack and say, okay, that was the previous government. No, it's not. As a government, we have pledged to the international community that we will find a solution to, on the case of accountability, on the case of missing person, right? On the case of atrocities committed, allegedly, if some atrocities have been committed, and we are determined to continue those things. And in addition to that, it's a very important thing, the government has established another presidential commission of inquiry with a Supreme Court judge. Uh, I, I think it's not nice to say the nationality, but he's a, uh, he's a Muslim gentleman. He's a very well seasoned, experienced judge. And then there are two other people and a Tamil lady, a former mayoress of Jaffna. So ethnicity is there, the gender balance is there, and their mandate is to study all previous commission reports like uh, Lessons Learned and Reconciliation Commission, Paranagama Commission, even Darusman report which we again mm -hmm, yeah. don't accept but to study and then UN resolution and to come out with a tangible, meaningful, measurable way of finding answers in a stipulated time period. Mm -hmm. This is not a commission which is appointed for years to buy time. Mm -hmm. They have been given a mandate they have given a time period of six months, right? And I, I hope they will do a great job. And then we will be able to find solution to these issues. Now the issue of accountability. 
the UN itself, they are flawed. You know, one report says 70,000 and the same document in another place says 7,000, right? Now we have to understand we were at a war, we were at a conflict, we were at a violent armed conflict. In a conflict, people died. But if 70,000 people died in the last phases of the war, where are the bodies? Where are the skeletons? None. 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 So that means there had not been that many losses during the final stages of the war. And also we have to remember the LTTE kept 300,000 people as a human shield. Right? Now on a particular day in 2009, the Colombo based Western diplomats were taken to the Air Force Operation Room and they were shown a live recording of an unmanned aerial vehicle over hovering over Pudumatalan and Mullivaikkal. What they saw, large number of Tamil people were trying to come out and the LTTE was shooting at them. This is not what we say, this is what they saw. Right? So the LTTE was keeping them as a human shield and they were firing at the army within that human shield and the army had to really exercise restraint because they did not want to kill civilians and their target was zero casualties. That's a good, great ambition. And all these 300,000 people were rescued and on that particular day, the government military forces completely changed their attitude. And on that particular day, the, the, because the army was fighting with the, the Tamil separatists, but they became the protector of these people. They were taken to various centers, they were very taken care of, they were given medicine, and after a lapse of few years, they were sent back to their homes, they were given jobs, some of them were rehabilitated. Now, uh, the word on rehabilitation, 12,500 ex-LTT combatants either surrendered, discovered or sent by their parents or he is the LTT guy, mm -hmm. rehabilitate him, were rehabilitated in Sri Lanka. To date, none of them went back to violence. What does that mean? We did not uh, take uh, these 12,500 to courts. Mm -hmm. We did not punish them. Instead, we taught them passion, love, peace language, skills, now they are doing very well, right? So where is human right violation in this? Why are we accused of violating human rights by the supranational body? I don't understand. We don't understand in Sri Lanka and we feel it's not fair. Tourist services get degraded with the language barrier. Viz. Hotel room boy, front officer or while roaming in the country. This makes an instant solution to increase relationship building with it in Tamil, Muslim, Sinhala or any other any language to communicate faster to build business with tourists, convey our hospitality conveyed and hereditary information. The nature medicines practiced for over 3000 years in the developing world failed in finding solutions but we got together with Sinhala Vita Rumia to germinate and treat foreigners with endless admiration who has spent thousands of dollars to recover whereas traditional doctors cure it effortlessly. This creates jobs for the poor in the village to grow medicinal plants for local use and export, opening new ventures and entrepreneurship irrespective of Tamils, Muslims or Sinhalese clients. Um, so if, if I were to take you to four very specific concerns that the U United Nations Human Rights Commissioner has raised, and this is the milita militarization of civilian government functions. Rever of, you spoke about the reversal of uh, constitutional safeguards, surveillance and harassment of journalists, lawyers, civil society and activists, and the margin marginalization and exclusion of Tamil and Muslim minorities um, in the national vision and government policy. What would your rebuttal of... Well, I would say... Uh, and then let me ask you a question, a retired military person, you know, in Sri Lanka, we have voluntary service, you know, no one is forced to join the military, they have joined the military on their own. Uh, and in the military, we retire pretty early, right? For a sailor, they retired at the age of like 44 years. And for an officer, mandatory requirement is 55. But some people retired even early. Now, what is wrong with the senior retired military officer being appointed to perform another function because he's still so to say young and he has a wealth of experience he's a disciplined soldier 
and he bring lot of leadership skills and he has lot of endurance because you are trained to be uh, having endurance in the military right so i think and this is not the only country the retired military persons are appointed to high positions many countries do that general colin powell of america he was a general now he was appointed as secretary of state mm. there is nothing wrong in it right so this militarization i don't agree i mean in this report there are three names mentioned so let me explain one name minister sarath virasekar he retired i think about 15 years ago and he contested parliament three times first time from ampara he won he became a parliamentarian second time he contested from ampara he lost third time he contested from kalambu and he got the most number of preferential votes in kalambu now is it wrong for him to be a minister that is the people's choice mm. right and then of course our army commander's name is mentioned this president did not appoint this army commander he was appointed by the previous government mm. this president only honored that commitment right so therefore this militarization doesn't hold any argument the president is determined to change the country make things happen this is his slogan make things happen and if he find that uh, some things are not moving because he has uh, this belief that the senior military officers are able to perform job now uh, royal look at the covid handling do you think if not for the army involvement the sri lanka would be within the first 10 best countries of handling covid no way right so there is absolutely uh, nothing to uh, uh, discuss about uh, this one dr narayana as the national most outstanding entrepreneur of 1996 saw that our job generation is stuck at a lower entrepreneurship of 3% and the country must be enhanced to 18% like vietnam similar to us as a war torn country but regained by exports though economic spiritual and environmental innovations commercialized this will end the external poverty of tamils and sinhala persons while muslims have excelled in trading for generations and their help each other made them rich we got an innovation economy declared as 69th independence day by the president at that time we had the opportunity of commercializing our coir pack and pack grow which had our worldwide patent costing us ours 300 meters on r&d they had a us dollar 545 billion market to replace expanded polystyrene which is non biodegradable but our innovation could grow trees from discards as published in the world news by cnn after winning the first prize at international inventors exhibition beating 43 countries now saudi arabian countries grow trees in deserts and 50324 exporters in 104 coconut growing countries are minting money from our parents as local banks has no vision but only debt financing helping the traders and not the inventors of the country who generate jobs and wealth for the country the world packaging organization offered us two world star awards for the invention and you are Uh, second question is uh, again uh, i think the the we talked about the constitution as safeguards mm. but we discussed that already but uh, perhaps surveillance and harassment yeah now surveillance and harassment now you see we neglected national security after 2015 brilliantly well we dismantled all the intelligence agencies we confiscated their files we disbanded their camps right and we said the army military intelligence don't do anything right that the police uh, only handle it and what was the result right we didn't know until the easter bombers right they had training they had explosive they had factories and they had safe houses we didn't know and we received 92 warnings and we didn't heed to them what does that mean that means we had a very lack or relaxed attitude to national security we had completely broken down Milit- uh, intelligence surveillance in this country so do you want a similar thing to happen to sri lanka again answer is no we don't want that to happen we don't want people to die indiscriminately and therefore the president is giving high priority to national security now some people who incite violence through new media through social web paging some people who want uh, uh, to divide the country some people who want to uh, incite in the minds of young people hatred and fight and violence 
they have been caught right because nowadays you know you are not living in a watertight uh, egg watertight mm. compartment the moment you are linked with uh, whatsapp you are exposed mm. right so technically you can be tracked mm. right these are the people that surveillance may have been carried out taken to courts punished or charged right it is not anyone else right i think uh, sri lanka is quite a free country everywhere is free but we need to pay attention to national security if we do not pay attention to national security we are doomed to fail once again we have a lesson 2019 and is the uh, religious extremism dead in sri lanka no not at all mm. it is very much alive right is the ltte ideology of a separate state dead in sri lanka not at all there are large uh, groups of uh, ltte remnants they want to separate the country again they want violence again they are calling people in sri lanka okay i'll give you uh, 10000 dollars can you plant a bomb fortunately not many takers fortunately we know who is telling who right so this is important for a country otherwise there will be breaches of national security again mm-hmm. so we need to maintain surveillance in the country and of course you see now during the period uh, leading up to 2009 did we have any control on the madrasas did we know what they were teaching did we know who uh, who were the preachers coming from which country and what were they preaching we didn't know right so we need to find ways right now if you take a pirivana you know you have a system your mm-hmm. syllabus is approved by the department of education if you take the hampasala the hampasala should be a common thing mm-hmm. it's good to teach uh, the religion to the young people mm-hmm. but then not extremist idea mm-hmm. so if we don't watch them and allow anyone to do anything we are doomed to fail although dr narayana was an advisor of the government we couldn't use the funding he bought with a credit line with 1.2% annum from japan for the government a 5 billion us dollar fund which was abandoned to collect as someone in the ministry asked for 5% for a commission to deposit in his favor It ended there and no bank offered credit to commercialize the invention the country could have paid off accumulated loans created by past regimes. In the CNN World News story attracted a Canadian waste research company to send US dollar 300 meters to commence the project to go global as organized by FJD Sirim a 100 year law firm who understood the value to the country as WIPO declared Sri Lanka to be Asia's eco-friendly hub of Asia. Just before signing the joint venture 3 days ahead LTTE bomb blast killed 425 people in Peta and the Toronto Dominion Bank withdraw the fund allocation. So who is responsible and accountable? Ask from UNHRC. If this project was realized we could have paid our accumulated loans and the joint venture with Germany to produce waste coir dust packaging wanted by Walmart and Deco would panel boards with full production indented by US a closet manufacturer as it is 33% lighter and 33% stronger than MDF boards and it is totally biodegradable We could have sold the license to 104 coconut growing countries and earn by giving the license and franchises Flexport Innovations was declared as a flagship company by Boy but fund withdrawal was on crib for 24 years thanks to LTTE Let's look at Sri Lanka in the larger picture um, this pivot to Asia has been happening for a while now but being as we are in Asia and US foreign secretary what do you think Sri Lanka needs to do what allegiances alliances and relationships does Sri Lanka need to build to fully t- make use of our position here now in Asia. However, those who copied our patents almost 324 exporters collected our apostrophe S.164 billion from selling coir dust which was invented by Flexport Innovations. If they were value added with 127 product lines what would be the outcome? Who made Sri Lanka to loss its economic war? LTTE. Yes. So who is responsible and accountable? Ask from UNHRC Professor Cather of Brighton University come in introducing making automated machines and use of artificial intelligence but abandoned for Sri Lanka banking system has no authentic venture capital system and angel investors and crib entry made by LTTE actions 
We want to give job opportunities in South, North, East but all abandoned due to whose fault? But now the time has come to join to build Sri Lanka as Australian, and Indonesian companies are interested and why not our own diaspora? Year 2000 Flexport Innovations was selected as Global Green Project at Expo 2000 Handover Exhibition for its Sustainable Development Initiatives. We won many joint ventures but abandoned due to war in the country. Yeah, as I mentioned a little earlier as well, <clears throat> Sri Lanka is in the central location in the Indian Ocean. And we are neighbors to the biggest military power, economic power, population that is India in the Indian Ocean. And we are crossroads to maritime trade, maritime commerce. So therefore, we are in a critically geostrategically important location. So this location gives us advantage. Why? Because we can make use of the maritime trade uh, to be the maritime hub of the region. But at the same time, this location attract unnecessary attention from the big powers. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at the Indian Ocean, right now it is the most militarized ocean in the world. Not Atlantic, not Pacific, the Indian Ocean. Right? What does this mean? That means large number of warships, large number of submarines, and large number of military aircraft is in the Indian Ocean. What do they all want? They want to protect their shipping. They want to be here. Right? So what we need is, we are very keen on maintaining the peace and stability of the Indian Ocean. And we want international rules-based maritime order in the Indian Ocean because we are a small country. Mm -hmm. Well, in maritime sense, we are very big. But, you know, size-wise, we are small, population small, economy small. But in strategic terms, we are a big power, mm -hmm. right? Now, we have this unwarranted attraction to this country because every major player wants to have a foothold here. Mm -hmm. So, how do we balance this attraction? It's a fatal attraction. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, although it is an attraction, it is a fatal attraction. Now, that is why the president has been very clear in his foreign policy. You ask about our role. He says, technically, we are a non-aligned country, perfectly all right. But we all know non-alignment movement was created after the World War II. And the world is very different to what it was then to mm. now. But still, we are uh, technically. We want to maintain neutrality. Mm. That is the key foreign policy directive of the president and the government. Maintain neutrality. We don't want to bandwagon with any major power. We don't want to take sides, one side against mm -hmm. the other. We don't want to hedge one country against the other. We want to remain neutral. Whilst we remain neutral, we want to have economic engagements with all the countries to uplift the people, uplift the economic development of people. So these are very clear foreign policy directive. For the first time in our history, we have a written 20-point foreign policy directive for 2020 and beyond. First time in the country. So I'm very proud because I played a role in that with the President's and the President's Secretary, Honorable Minister and the team in the Foreign Ministry. This clearly state our foreign policy. So this is the challenge we have. How do we stay away from this major power competition? How do we benefit economically to our people in this major competition, if you look at the spheres of influence of these major powers, if you look at the axis of influence of these major powers, everything crisscross mm -hmm. on Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. So we have a huge task. How do we maintain balance on this? And the only way is to be is to remain neutral. Mm -hmm. Because if we take one side, then again we are doomed to fail. Mm -hmm. So this is a very challenging job. I think so far we have been doing it very well. But also let me say that we are very conscious about India's strategic security concern. Mm -hmm. Now we don't want India to feel insecure because of Sri Lanka. So we don't want any country to use our territory or our sea to be a threat to India. Mm -hmm. Because India is too big. Mm -hmm. India is our neighbor. We want to have good relations with India. But at the same time, we want to have good relations with China, Japan, America, EU, UK, South Korea, ASEAN countries, everyone, Russia. Mm -hmm. right? One may think what is the relation with Russia and the Indian Ocean. Russia is big time in the Indian Ocean. Mm -hmm. 
right. right? So we need to maintain friendly relations and economic empowerment of, of our people. Because you see, we are going through a very difficult yes. time economically because of the COVID pandemic. Mm -hmm. Of course, the whole world is going through a difficult time. We need to overcome this pandemic and we need to uh, uh, rebound on our economic development. The only way we can do is attracting foreign direct investment. To attract foreign direct investment, we need peace, mm -hmm. we need stability, we need mechanism, we need procedures, we need laws. We need to be up on the ease of doing business, mm. right, in order to attract uh, foreign direct investment. For us, we need to be a producing country. You know, earlier we were importing everything and we were just doing little bit of business, bring something, add value, add, not even add value, mm. add money and sell it. But no, we need to change from that import dependent economy to export oriented economy. We have to produce more. We have to produce more vegetables, fruits, because in the whole world, uh, there is a requirement of vegetables and fruits. So we need to be a production oriented country. Mm -hmm. We need to attract businesses. We need to attract foreign direct investment. And we need to create that environment which is conducive mm -hmm. for that kind of a thing. And we can do it. I think we have the best advantage and uh, we have a stable government. Mm -hmm. We have a majority in the parliament. And I think that we all must. This is actually the time royal that people of this country should forget the minor differences on ethnic city, ethnic, based on ethnicity, based on political ideology, based on class ideology. This is the time the whole country should be united as one. They can have their political ideologies, but what we, the need of the hour is to overcome the economic impact of the pandemic. Now, in that sense, you see the UN Human Rights Commissioner is saying, oh, there should be target, targeted sanctions against this country. If there are economic sanctions against Sri Lanka, is it going to affect only one community? No, it will impact all Sri Lankans. So that is not what we need, mm -hmm. right? So the reconciliation is a buzzword. I personally believe the reconciliation should evolve from us, evolve from our society, evolve from our community. Not someone point a gun at you and say, reconcile. Mm -hmm. It will never happen. Mm -hmm. It will only divide more people. This majoritarian discourse that we have had in the country after 2015 is because people felt that we betrayed the country. That is not what we want. We must forget about that. We must have one country, one people and one nation. They are still workable thanks for UN who has accepted on our 127 product lines could give job opportunities to the poor including Tamil community. Flexport was invited by the UN Sustainable Development Summit in 2002 to innovative solutions at the World Leaders Forum we created and the local political environment couldn't gather the vital few but went on trivial many for the last 72 years ignoring the innovation commercialization. Why I blow my trumpet not to make a mark but those who are jobless in villages would be utilized in production using our innovations unfortunately our past leaders are blunt innovation commercialization but now we got a leader who is capable of commercializing making all communities together for prosperous Sri Lanka. Asia Foundation, Faculty of Dreams, Lanka Suwai and Foundation are being formed to implement them to end poverty in villages. UN was very supportive and UNHRC could solve many problems in using our innovative strategies of Flexport innovations to give job opportunities for poor Tamil communities trained by Flexport Center for Innovation, Incubation and Enterprise Development equals and short flex side. There are three categories of innovations namely Economic innovations Spiritual innovations Environmental innovations this could solve you in Millennium 17 goals all to be accomplished. Thank you very much, uh, Admiral Kolumbage, and I wish you success going forward into a very challenging time with the UNHRC um, and also in your role as Foreign Secretary because it seems, uh, as you've explained now, there's, a lot, there's lots of competing interests that you have to balance and manage mm -hmm. with a vision in mind. So thank you very much for your time. Uh, and I wish you success. Thank you very much for giving this opportunity sh to share. Thank you. Thank you. The nature vision was left to us by Buddha.
Now we could be listening to all global villagers as requested by our friend Sir Arthur Clarke and we can stop any more world shutdowns, using sustainable developments and growing natural medicinal plants in our barren lands mostly in north and east making them enriched and growing plants even in deserts which Koyer Pak and Pak Grow has proved. But we need all Sri Lankan together without separation to make it possible. Stop divide and rule strategy which failed for last 72 years making poor the poors, and rich and poor has a huge gap creating eternal wars by short-sighted politicos of the country and UNHRC has points to exemplify by using our innovations to get together as one nation. That is how Flexport Innovations built 50,324 enterprises in 104 coconut growing countries for our inventor apprenters to replicate. Finally as a grandson of D.J.Y. Marjorindra the pioneer of hydroelectricity Dr. Narayana at the transcendence to his educated children and confident that his fifth generation would do as they are spared in USA, Singapore, UK etc. Chogam, was an ideal forum for Sri Lanka to give 43 poorest countries to enrich using sustainable development strategies of Flexseed to plant the Sri Lankan hybrid making eternal poor in the global village to become their quality of life enhanced. This will pay off our all loans accumulated by all political parties to pay off by innovations and 1. Economy 2. National security 3. Economic development 4. Foreign relationships undisrupted and as a nature-loving country Flexport Innovations Private Limited. Number 27, Jambu Gazmala Mawatha. New Jayagoda. 10,250. Sri Lanka. www.flexport.lk. www.flexseed.lk. www.ultinc.lk. Mobile, plus 94714350. 0939. Email, flexportceo at gmail.com.